In this video, we're going to talk about a really unintuitive coin flipping problem that is a ton of fun. Um, it's unintuitive because secretly there's Markov chains showing up, or, or more specifically, a single Markov chain showing up underneath the surface. Uh, and what we're going to notice is that what feels like a pretty easy coin flipping probability problem ends up being a little bit more intricate than that. So here's the setup. Let's say we flip a coin until we see one of two patterns, either heads, heads, tails, or heads, tails, tails. And the question is, which one is more likely to occur? And the easy, obvious answer is that they are equally likely. I've pitched this problem to tons of students, uh, literally hundreds, and always people will start off by saying, well, we know a little bit about probabilities and coin flips are independent. And so the probability of seeing heads and heads and tails is really equal to the probability of seeing heads times the probability of seeing heads times the probability of seeing tails. And each of these is a one half probability. So half times half times half is an eighth. And then we could look at our second case and we could say, all right, the probability of seeing heads, tails, tails is really the probability of seeing a heads times the probability of seeing a tails times the probability of seeing a tails again. And what do you know? All of these probabilities are a half. And so this probability is an eighth. Same trick question, right? Well, actually, there's a lot more going on than that. Because the thing that we should notice is that we're not actually flipping a coin three times and then starting over. What we're doing is we're going to flip a coin however many times it takes to see one of these patterns. So we're not going to stop flipping our coin until the most current three flips are heads, heads, tails, or heads, tails, tails. So we may end up flipping our coin three, four, five times, who knows, maybe even longer until we see one of these patterns show up. So this maybe becomes a, at least a different problem. Maybe it's harder, maybe it's not, but at least it's something that we have to think about. And calculating this probability by hand can be really frustrating because unlike in this case where we were cons considering just three flips, we may end up having more flips than that. And there are tons of possibilities that we could have. And so figuring out all of those probabilities by hand could be really, really difficult. So what we're going to do instead is we're just going to try it. We're going to flip a coin. We're going to actually see what happens here. And we're going to investigate this. So let me pull up a little coin flipper and we'll see how this goes. So we're looking for two things. We're looking for either heads, heads, tails, or heads, tails, tails. And we'll just flip our coin and we'll keep a little tally of which patterns show up. So let's start. Our first flip is heads. So I'll write down an H. Then I get another heads. Another heads. And tails. All right. And so our first pattern, heads, heads, tails. We're going to do this a whole bunch of times. All right, one for each. So I'm going to keep going. All right, we did this 15 times, and 10 of those times we got heads, heads, tails as the winning pattern, and only five of those times we got heads, tails, tails as the winning pattern. So a quick little summary, heads, heads, tails was two-thirds of the time, and heads, tails, tails was a third of the time. Now the problem with this is that we expected half and half. 
So the question is, what's going on here? First, are we convinced that these aren't actually equally likely. It's possible that we just got kind of unlucky with our coin flips, right? Uh, we watched that all happen, so we know that I didn't rig anything. It was just whatever came out of our coin flips. And maybe we just got a little lucky or unlucky, depending on your perspective. Or maybe we do actually have a, a kind of difference here. Maybe heads, heads, tails is a little bit more likely. What we probably know, though, is that 15 coin flips may not be enough to convince us. So let's try and do a lot more. Instead of you sitting there watching a time lapse of me flip a coin a whole bunch of times, what we're going to do is get some more trials by writing a little computer program to do this. Now, this won't be that hard. All we have to do is think about what the algorithm is. What's the step-by-step -step process that we ran through there to do this by hand? When we were flipping coins, what were our steps? And we'll try and be pretty specific. And then we'll see if we can just convert that to something a computer could understand. We're going to use a language called Python, which is pretty easy. Even me, somebody who is bad at writing computer programs, can actually do this. So here's our algorithm. First, we flipped a coin. Then we wrote down the result. And then we checked. Do the last three coin flips match either of the patterns? Oh, that's supposed to say patterns. That's silly. Oops. See, look at this. I can't spell anyways. If it doesn't, repeat steps one and three. Now, we had to at least flip our coin three times to be able to do this. So for the first try and the second try, this last little step here uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if we flip a coin a whole bunch of times, then we're just currently looking at whatever those three flips are. Um, and if they match, great. And if not, we'll just keep flipping our coin and writing down the result and checking our patterns. If they do match, then we added a little tally to whatever winning pattern we found whether it was heads, heads, tails, or heads, tails, tails. And we can repeat those steps a whole bunch of times. So we did it 15 times, where N, we'll say this is our number of trials. And for us, it was 15, but we'd like more. And then at the end, we'll just compare the totals. Uh, we were able to calculate a little frequency, right? We noticed, oh, five and 10. So out of 15, that's one-thirds and two-thirds, right? 33.333% and 66.6666667% or whatever you want to round this off to. Uh, and so we'll do that. Now, what we're going to do is write it up like this. Instead of thinking about heads and tails, we're going to think about zeros and ones. And we're going to randomly select from zero and one. This is going to simulate our coin flip. We're going to add our coin flip, either zero or one, to a list. And we're only going to keep the most current three flips because we really didn't care about the first ones once we had more than three. Then we're going to check this against our patterns. If it doesn't match, we're going to repeat steps one and three over and over and over again. If it does match, we'll move on to step four and we'll say add one to the winning pattern. And then we'll repeat those steps a whole bunch of times and compare the totals. Most of this is the same. We're just changing the language a little bit. Instead of coin flips, we're talking about zeros and ones. Instead of writing it down, we're going to add it to a list, etc., etc. So let's go ahead and see some actual code here. So this is what it looks like. Here's our code. What we're going to do is start off by importing this random package for Python. This is going to allow us to randomly select things. So here's our setup. I'm going to call this population. These are all the possibilities. I'm going to call zero heads and one tails. Our first pattern is heads, heads, tails. So we have zero, zero, one. Our second pattern is heads, tails, tails. And so we have zero, one, one. I probably could have called these like HTT and HHT if I was a little bit more I don't know, creative, but I'm calling them pattern one and pattern two. The nice part about this is that you can swap these things out for other patterns really quickly. Uh, we're going to do a million trials here, which is going to be pretty big. And I'm going to start our counters for the number of wins at zero. So currently, each pattern has zero wins because we haven't actually done anything yet. Here's the chunk of code that we're going to use to flip these coins and check the patterns that we see. I'm going to use a for loop, and basically we're saying for x in the range from zero up to the number of trials. So we're going to do this a million times. Uh, we're going to start with an empty list of flips. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to, as long as our list of flips does not match either pattern, this little symbol here means is not equal to, what we're going to do is flip a coin. And we're going to randomly choose from our population of zeros and ones. We're going to append that to our flip list, which was blank, but now we're going to have something in there. Append just means put it at the end. And so we're going to tack on whatever flip we get, zero or one. And then this little bit of code here basically just says only look at the last three. So I'm going to cut my list down each time so I only have three numbers in it. That way my list isn't going to get super big and I really only care about the current three anyways. Now this while loop says this is going to do that as long as our flip list does not match our pattern. So after each section of running this, it's going to first go back and check, does our list equal the first pattern or the second pattern? And if not, it's going to do it again. And then if it does, we're going to stop and move on to the next stuff. If our flip list is equal to the first pattern, we're going to add one to the counter for the number of wins for that first pattern. And if our flip list is equal to the second pattern, we're going to add one to our counter for the second pattern. Then I'm just calculating a little percentage here. So I'm just going to round off the number of wins divided by the number of trials, multiply it by 100, and we'll print out some little summary statements here. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Now, we're flipping this coin a million times while this is running. And it might take a little bit, but it likely won't take long. Here we go. All right, so our first pattern, heads, heads, tails, won 667,199 times. So uh, around 66.72%. And the second pattern, heads, tails, tails, won 332,801 times, or 33.28%. So this is really close to what we noticed with our kind of one-third, two-third split. So maybe this is a bit more evidence because remember, what we're looking at now is a million coin flips. And so hopefully we're seeing that this is uh, pretty convincing. So what we want to do is answer the question, why is this happening? Why is this weird uh, not 50-50 chance showing up? And the answer is that we've got Markov chains showing up here. So first, a brief introduction to what Markov chains are. Uh, we're really only going to talk about a Markov pro property here, and it's for random events x1, x2, all the way up to xn. We have these conditional probabilities. Now, a conditional probability, that's this vertical bar right here. What that means is we're looking at the probability of this random event xn equaling some value, given that all of these events have equaled other values. This conditional probability basically says, if all of these things have already happened, what's the probability of this happening? And the Markov property says, well, it's really just the probability that the random event capital X sub n equals little x sub n, conditioned on the random event capital X sub n minus 1 equaling little x sub n minus 1. Now this is kind of bulky notation, so I'm going to simplify this down a little bit. Basically, if we have all of these random events, what we're saying is that the probability of some new random event, given that all of these things have already occurred, is really equal to just this new random event given that the most recent one occurred. This means that all of these are negligible. They don't actually matter. They don't impact our probability. So this is really what the Markov property is saying. The probability of some future event happening given a whole history of past events, that's exactly equal to some future event happening given just the most current event showing up. So we can kind of think about some examples. A classic example of this is a really kind of short-sighted weather model. If you have a sunny day, maybe it's more likely that a sunny day is going to show up the next day. So given that we have a sunny day today, maybe the probability that tomorrow is sunny is something. And really, it doesn't matter that yesterday and the day before that were rainy because today is sunny. And so maybe tomorrow may also be sunny. Um, a, a maybe better example or, or less 
um, simplified example is what Markov was actually looking at when he discovered this property, or maybe not discovered, but kind of formalized this. Uh, he was analyzing a poem, and he was looking at the structure of words in here. And he noticed that there was a, a probability of, of vowels occurring, and I don't have the probabilities off the top of my head. Um, but there was some sort of frequency of vowels, maybe 42%, we'll say, of all of the letters uh, in the poem were vowels. But when he looked at the letters preceding it, he noticed that it was not very likely that if your current letter was a vowel, that the next letter would also be a vowel. It was like 18%. So the probability that given that the current letter is a vowel, that the next letter is a vowel is only 18%. When really, if we just kind of considered a random letter being a vowel, it's much higher. And he also found that the probability that your current letter was a consonant and your next letter being a vowel, or maybe I should say the probability that your next letter is a vowel given that or conditional on your current letter being a consonant was pretty high. It was like uh, over 60%, I think. So we have this disparity of the next letter given our current letter. And Markov postulated that the probability of the next letter being a vowel was really only dependent on what this previous letter is. It didn't matter um, what the letter, you know, four letters ago was. What really matters is whether we're looking at a consonant and then a vowel or a vowel and then a vowel. So that's the Markov property. We'll notice that this is not describing an independent event, which is what we normally think of coin flips as. And so what we need to do is try and figure out how our situation actually has this property in it. And I think the easier way of doing it is to simplify our problem down. Let's look at a smaller case where we just compare heads heads versus tails heads. So it's the exact same situation as earlier, except now we're going to be looking for an ending pattern of heads heads versus an ending pattern of tails heads. Only two coin flips. So, now again, we may have more than two coin flips. So let me write this down. Uh, we've got heads, heads versus tails, heads. I'm going to write out all of the possibilities of two coins flipping. We've got heads, 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 tails, 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 or tails, heads, sorry, and tails, tails. And I'll circle these up and we'll call these states. These are the possible states of our most current two flips. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just imagine that we don't have this ending situation where we're specifically looking for these two patterns, and we're just going to try and draw our Markov chain and see how it moves. So let's say we're starting at heads, heads, and we flip another coin. We're either going to add on a heads, in which case you'll notice our most two current flips are heads, heads. Or we'll add on a tails, where our most current two flips are heads, tails. So from our state heads, heads, we can either transition to heads, heads, or transition to heads, tails. From heads, tails, notice our next flip could be either a head or a tail, and so that would transition us to tails, heads, or tails, tails. If we're at tails, heads, our next flip could either be a heads or a tails, and so we'd go heads, heads, or heads, tails. And lastly, if we're already on tails, tails, we could either flip a head, in which case we get tails, heads, or tails, tails. You'll notice we've got this nice symmetric looking diagram here, and I'll just say this, all of these probabilities from these arrows are 50%, because either we have another head or a tail. But in our setup, we have these ending states right here and right here. Meaning, once we see a head head, we're never going to leave that state. We're going to stop our game. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a new arrow here, and I'm going to say, let's signify that by saying we have a 100% chance of, if you're on heads heads, to just stay there. Similarly, we're never going to leave the state tails heads because we're going to stop flipping our coin. And so once you enter this state tails heads, you have a 100% chance of staying there. So this 
is actually what our diagram looks like. And now you can notice that in this two flip heads heads versus tails heads scenario, we have a really strange thing happening. The only way possible for heads heads to win is if you flip it right off the bat. Because if your first two flips are anything else other than heads heads, we might bounce around this Markov chain a little bit, but no matter what, you'll see all of these states eventually lead to tails heads. We call these two states absorbing states, because once you enter that state, you can't exit it. But we'll also notice that over here at heads heads, we have this isolated state where you actually can't enter it. The way that we've picked our coin flips is it removes all of the previous natural entrances to heads heads. So that's kind of a strange thing that we're noticing. Now, what we can do is extend this to this three flip situation, the one that we started with, and we're gonna notice that our diagram gets a little bit more convoluted and a little bit more confusing. But we're gonna look for this same kind of thing happening where we erase these arrows and we're gonna see how when we cleverly picked the two patterns that we were looking for, we kind of rigged the game a little bit. So let's do the same thing again. Heads, heads, tails versus heads, tails, tails. And now I gotta actually remember all of the possibilities for three coin flips. Heads, heads, heads will be one. Uh, then we'll go heads, heads, tails. Uh, we can do heads, tails, heads and we can do tails, heads, heads. We'll do heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, 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 heads, and tails, tails, tails. That's eight of them, right? That's all of them. All right, cool. So let's draw in our states, and I'm gonna fill in all of the arrows for our Markov chain without this ending condition. I need to draw a better circle for it to recognize that this is actually a circle. There we go. So I'll draw in all of our arrows without our ending condition and then we'll fix our diagram. So from heads, 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 you can flip either another heads, in which case you have the last two heads plus another one, so you stay here, or you can flip a tails. From heads, heads, tails, we can either go to heads, tails, heads, or heads, tails, tails. From tails, heads, heads, our next state is going to start with two heads, so it's either going to be heads, 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 or heads, heads, tails. From heads, tails, heads, our next state is gonna start with tails, heads, so it's either going to be tails, heads, heads, right here, there it is, or tails, heads, tails, right here. Heads, tails, tails, we're going to enter a state that starts with two tails, and so we have these ones. For tails, heads, tails, we're going to enter a state that starts with a an heads and a tails, so that's either here or here. For tails, tails, heads, we're going to start with a T and an H, so where are those ones? Right here and all the way over here. And for tails, 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 we're going to either go back to tails, 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 or we're gonna to go to tails, tails, heads. And again, all of these probabilities are 50%. This is kind of a mess of a diagram, right? So now let's go ahead and consider our actual case where this is an ending state. And so once we're at heads, heads, tails, this arrow doesn't exist anymore. We're not leaving this state and this one doesn't exist anymore. We're not leaving this state. We're gonna stay here with 100% probability. And similarly, we're gonna have the same kind of thing for this state. So we don't leave, and we don't leave. It becomes this nice absorbing state where we stay there with 100% probability. Now what you'll notice is that I erased a dotted arrow, or sorry, an arrow right here that was transitioning from heads, heads, tails to heads, tails, tails. Because if we didn't stop here, we could flip another tails after this and our new pattern is heads, tails, tails.
So we may be able to see the issue. When we cleverly picked these two stages, we ended up removing one of the entrances to one of the patterns that we were looking at. So it becomes a little less likely. And even more than that, we can look at these two cases right here. Notice that in these two stages, in these two cases, what we're going to notice is that we have to get funneled over to this heads, heads, tails state, right? If we're at heads, 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 the only possibilities are that we stay there or we move on. So eventually we're going to move on and we're going to end up at heads, heads, tails. At tails, heads, heads, the only possibilities are that we're going to move on to either heads, heads, tails, and then we're done, or over to heads, 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 in which case we run into that problem that we had. The only event that leads in to heads, tails, tails is right here, but we're going to notice that it has a 50% chance of not leading into that and filtering itself over somewhere else. And so we end up with this unequally weighted probability. Now, if you wanted to see this and compute these actual probabilities that we end in either one of these absorbing states, what we'd have to do is do a bunch of linear algebra. We'd take this diagram and we'd turn it into a matrix where each of our stages ends up being a, a row and a column. And the cells in our matrix end up being a probability of transitioning from one stage to the other based on the row and column that it's in. You can do a bunch of linear algebra on here, matrix and vector operations and things like that, and we'll end up actually getting a one-third versus two-thirds probability of ending in either of these absorbing states. I don't think we have to do the linear algebra, though, to see the disparity in this diagram. So that's where I'm going to leave it. So here's our summary. This seemed like a really easy problem, but when we made that slight change where instead of flipping a coin three times, stopping and starting over, we flip a coin until we see a specific pattern, it becomes a lot more complex and it becomes a lot more unintuitive. I love these unintuitive problems because we really have to think cleverly about them. Now you'll also notice we had to be clever about how we picked the two patterns for this to work. Because if we didn't pick patterns where we erased one of the entrances to those states, we maybe wouldn't have had this disparity. Now again, we could do a bunch of linear algebra on what we call a transition matrix to calculate the win probabilities for each of these patterns. But I think just watching this video, we've got some pretty compelling evidence just from those Python uh, lines and also from this diagram that we have. And lastly, visualizing the state diagrams in this case can be a little complex, but I think they're really helpful. Now, that last bit probably isn't super helpful for you because you don't really see Markov chains a lot, especially in an undergraduate math curriculum. But in general, visualizations like this and thinking cleverly about how to take some almost abstract feeling problem and draw an actual picture of it, that's a really important bit of mathematical discovery that I think if we can do it cleverly, will help kind of unmuddle those details. It will clear up some of those strange problems that we're thinking about when we started this example. So anyways, this is one of my favorite coin flipping problems to show people um, because it's kind of mind boggling at first when we do the trials and people see, wait a second, this isn't actually 50-50 like we thought it was. Hopefully that was interesting. Hopefully that's something that you can think about and show off to some people. And uh, now you can say you know a little bit about Markov chains.